All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Amy Cataret. I am one of the co-chairs for the DEI Task Force for AAACN. Uh, happy Pride Day to all. Um, I am super excited as part of the DEI committee to be bringing uh, Nikki Alcala to us tonight as a speaker for uh, specializing in LGBT pronouns and helping us to better understand how we can provide culturally sensitive and competent care for our patient population. Nikki is the executive director of nursing for Fenway Health in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, she is an experienced public health nurse uh, executive working and focusing on health education, social justice and advocacy. Nikki's background is very diverse, uh, similar to what we're going to be talking about tonight with our diverse equity and, and inclusion presentation, but she's very focused and passionate about providing care to underserved and disenfranchised populations. So thank you so much, Nikki, for being here with us tonight, and you go ahead and take off with it. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, with fellow nurses and leaders in ambulatory care. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. I know it's it's late. It's probably after hours. You probably were already at the office for several hours today. So thank you for taking the time to learn how you, your organization, um, and your staff can really better serve um, patient populations that have not always had the best uh, experiences within healthcare. So thank you, thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with everyone. And if someone can just give me a thumbs up and confirm you can see my slide deck, we can jump right in. We can see you. Perfect. Thank you so much. So as Amy mentioned, my name is Nikki Alcala. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the executive director of nursing at Fenway Health in Boston, Massachusetts. We are a community health center that focuses on underserved patient populations, mainly the LGBT population, um, BIPOC population, and folks living with HIV and AIDS. June is Pride Month. Pride Month is a very happy celebration. Um, Annually, Pride is celebrated in June in honor of the 1969 Stonewall Rising that happened uh, in New York City um, at a bar where it was still very much illegal not only to appear or be homosexual, but to wear another gender's clothing. So it was really a tipping point um, for the liberation movement for the LGBT uh, population. So every, every month on, in June, um, it's proudly celebrated. So this uh, training, other uh, organizations offer um, trainings and support and celebration. You see everybody's logo turn rainbow in June. Um, that type of support is literally life-saving um, to our patients. So thank you so much again uh, for, for joining this. Uh, I have no disclosures uh, to share with anyone other than the fact that I do uh, work for Fenway Health. Today's uh, goals are to uh, understand the difference between sex, gender, gender expression, sexual orientation. A lot of times people use these terms interchangeably and that's not always accurate. So we'll start, we'll start with some um, education and 101 level info. Um, second goal is to identify actions that you can implement um, as well as your organization. Um, being supportive, letting our patients know that we are supportive, that we're responsive, that we're sensitive um, to their needs and their care is, is vital. Um, and I'm hoping to share uh, some ideas with you today. Um, lastly, you know, identify things that um, can really make that impact uh, not only for your organization, but, but for yourself, for your own practice as a nurse, uh, to make sure that you're connecting with LGBTQ patients, um, their partners and families in respectful and meaningful ways. <clears throat> so the why, you know, why, why do we have this training? Why is this important? Why are you joining me here today? So studies show us that underserved populations experience huge health disparities. This is not news to anyone. And while there's no specific LGBTQ illness, many illnesses disproportionately impact the patient population for many reasons. <clears throat> 
higher instances of self-harm, depression, suicidal ideation, addiction. Sadly, the list goes on. Up until 1973, homosexuality was listed in the DSM. Many members of the LGBTQ community received shock therapy and various forms of conversion therapy. As recently as the 1990s, 20% of doctors in California reported feeling uncomfortable treating gay patients. Creating a welcoming environment and a therapeutic relationship is one of the best ways that we can ensure uh, better outcomes for these patient populations. A more recent study showed that a third of nurses that were interviewed reported considerable difficulty working with LGBTQ patients and desired to avoid contact with these patients or even feared sexual advances from them. This is an issue when you consider that the 2022 Gallup poll concluded that 7.1% of adult Americans identify as LGBT or roughly over 20 million people. This fear and bias has very real impacts to patients in their health. However, studies also show us that creating a welcoming and affirming environment can improve patient outcomes and impact nursing sensitive indicators. Ah, this looks familiar to some of you, I'm sure. So the AAACN Ambulatory Care Nurse Sensitive Indicator uh, Industry Report um, from 2016 identified four new measures, one being patient engagement and patient activation. This measure has the potential to uniquely reflect the role of the registered nurse in ambulatory care, as well as promote enhanced nursing practice. A vital piece of patient engagement and activation is that therapeutic nursing patient relationship. LGBTQ plus bias can negatively impact that relationship. Further impacts of that bias, disenfranchisement of patients, a lack of trust in the nurse, the provider in the medical system, delay in seeking care if seeking care at all, fear for their own safety, risk for abuse, concerns for their treatment or mistreatment or othering, um, even personal privacy concerns, um, sometimes small towns, small practices, neighborhoods. Sadly, regardless of HIPAA, people talk, and this could be a huge issue um, for, for safety for patients. Okay, LGBTQQIA+, all the letters, all the asterisks, it gets, it gets confusing. It's a big alphabet soup. People uh, lovingly refer to it as alphabet soup. What, is, what does it all mean? So we're gonna, we're gonna break it down. What, what do these things stand for? You'll see it in different orders. You'll see some of it, you'll see a lot of it. It, it varies. Sadly, there uh, is no joint commission that comes in and tells us uh, what, what, which of these letters to use in which order. Um, but overall, it's an umbrella term it's a blanket statement to include uh, various sexual orientations, various gender identities, um, and it really kind of groups um, these patients together to identify themselves in ways that are not stereotypical normative. So these letters right here, L stands for lesbian, G is gay, B is bisexual, T is transgender, Q, sometimes there's one Q, sometimes there's two Qs. It can stand for queer, it can stand for questioning. Um, I can stand for intersex. A can be ally, A can be asexual. Plus means there's lots of other letters um, and, and words to put in there. So you'll see, you'll see different variations. I tried to stick with just one here. So you'll mostly see LGBTQ, um, but just know that we're talking about that, that umbrella term uh, of patients and folks in the world. All right, so the education piece. There's four components of identity, of our own identity, of patient's identity, and this is that piece that people kind of get confused and, and, and use in, intersectionally um, and interchange them, but they don't necessarily mean all the things. So we're gonna talk about the four main components of identity. One is assigned sex. Two is sexual orientation, three is gender identity, and four is gender expression. Number one, assigned sex. This one's pretty easy. It's usually designated at birth. It's usually male or female. Doctor says, it's a boy, it's a girl. Um, but there is variation there. 
It's generally based on genitalia, on what is seen at the birth. Um, but as we all know, babies can be born with ambiguous genitalia. Um, it can be unclear. Babies can be born, born intersex. So when someone says they're assigned sex, this is what they're talking about. We started easy. Next, your gender identity. Gender identity is just someone's personal experience of their own gender. What does that mean? That means it's in your head. What do you feel in your head? Do you, you feel like a woman? You feel like a man? It's what you, how you experience gender yourself, within yourself, in your brain, and in your body. Um, now, related back to what we first talked about, assigned at birth, if you are born and the doctor calls out, it's a girl, and you grow up and your gender identity is female, that aligns. Um, that is that is cisgendered. Now, if it if it varies, we'll get into that shortly. Next is your gender expression. So different from how you feel inside, different from how you identify, your gender expression is your outward expression of that gender. So you can be born, it's a girl. You can identify as a woman and you can dress uh, in typical masculine clothes. You can wear, you can be a tomboy. You can like sports. Things that our culture and things that our society has identified as, as male or as masculine. That does not mean you weren't assigned female at birth. That doesn't mean that in your head and in your body, you don't identify as female. That's just your expression of gender. The big thing to stress here is this varies greatly by culture. This uh, has huge impacts to societal norms, religious preferences, um, even time. Uh, you know, for, for many years, men always had very short hair and long hair was considered feminine. Um, you know, pants, dresses, skirts, a lot of these things are only considered um, norms or what gender should be or is um, based on what's popular, based on um, different things in our culture, social media, um, and a lot of that is starting to blur uh, with musicians, male musicians wearing dresses, skirts, um, things like that. So recap. One, assigned at birth. It's a boy, it's a girl. Two, gender identity. What you identify inside. Three, gender expression. That outward expression of your gender. And that could look like nail polish, hair, makeup. That your outward expression does not dictate you're assigned at birth or your gender identity. Here's some gender terminology for you. So we talked about, we touched on this a little bit. So cisgendered or cis, C-I-S. That's people that identify with the gender they were assigned at birth. So like I said, when I was born, doctor said, it's a girl. I identify in my mind as a woman. That is cisgendered. Transgender people whose gender identity is different from what was assigned at birth. And here it's the word trans, right? So it's a, it's a cross. So if it was, again, for my example, it's a girl. And then I identified in my mind and my body as a man, I would be transgender. Trans woman and trans man. Trans woman assigned male at birth and identifies as a woman. Sometimes you'll see that um, written in, um, medical charts as MTF, meaning man to male to female. Same thing with trans man. Assigned female at birth identifies as a man, uh, female to male. The thing to remember here is that they are identifying themselves as trans and the gender that they are. Trans woman, trans man. Gender queer. This, this term is a little more nuanced. All of them are nuanced. Um, the big thing to, to realize is this is a very broad stroke. We're talking about some very basic, big ideas. Some individual patients uh, will not feel this way, um, but this is some general ideas. This is the 100 level class. Hopefully triple ACN will have me back. Maybe we'll have a 200 level class. Um, so for gender queer, it's someone that does not identify with that binary, right? So to male or female, maybe they're both genders. Maybe they're neither gender. Maybe they're a combination of the genders. Um, people might reject that there's two genders at all. Um, there's also different cultural and spiritual beliefs. Um, 
in the indigenous population, there are two spirit, uh, which does not align with male, female um, gender identities. So if you hear someone identify as gender queer, gender fluid, gender expansive, it could be any of these or, or others. That's where the important conversation and the tool that I'll give to you right now is, what does that mean to you? If a patient, a coworker, a friend, your kid comes to you and says, I'm genderqueer, and you're like, great. What does that mean to you? And if you're, if you're their nurse, if you're involved in their healthcare, and how does that impact the care that I'm gonna provide for you today? Um, because we cannot make assumptions that just because someone is genderqueer, it means one thing, or that means this impacts this other thing. I remember in nursing school, we had cultural competency, like we were gonna learn it all and know. And we were taught all Muslim patient, patients do this, or you know, these patients, you always do this thing. Um, instead, we have to realize that this is so nuanced and so individualized. We really have to meet our patients where they're at and, and engage in that conversation. Again, we're bringing it back to that patient engagement, that patient activation, that therapeutic relationship between the patient um, and the nurse. Last on the li this list is agender. And those are folks that don't identify with any gender. Um, they uh, could be under gender queer or not. And like I said, it's very nuanced. Some folks will fit this to a T, some folks won't fit this at all. But this is again, that 100 level class just to really help you understand terminology when most people are talking about it and give you a base foundation to be able to understand when patients um, are sharing this information with you or you see it in a chart, someone discloses that info. Couple of pro tips for you. Transgender is an adjective. It is grammatically incorrect and could be possibly offensive to say someone is a trans, someone is transgendered, like they used to be transgender, transgenders. Um, also, it is outdated terminology to use the term transsexual. That was along those DSM lines um, of uh, psych um, diagnosis. Um, and it could be considered very offensive. And also it is not um, a preferred usage for gender or gender identity. So transitioning. This is again, a very nuanced topic and varies greatly from person to person and patient to patient. There are many ways in which a patient may or may not transition socially, meaning with their friends, with their family, they might use a different pronoun, they might not, they might change their name, they might not. Same thing with legal, they might change a gender marker on ID, on their insurance card, on their driver's license, they might legally change a name or they might not. Physically, um, there are different um, gender affirming health services that your, uh, your organizations might offer. There's um, HRT or hormone replacement therapy um, that causes different changes again to the body and that outward expression of gender. Um, there's different surgeries that uh, a patient can um, and will or will not opt into. Uh, same thing uh, with medical transition, some patients will or will not. There are many, many reasons, personal, spiritual, religious, financial, many different reasons for someone to transition in some of these, all of these or none of these ways. Please do not make assumptions that someone that is transgender will do any or all of these. It's again, very personal and uh, do not assume that there is a surgery or the surgery or that they're going on hormones or that they're on hormones. Again, have that conversation. If a patient discloses to you that they are transgender, what does that mean to you and how does that impact your healthcare? All right, next, sexual orientation. I save this one for the end because I think that most of us at this point are pretty familiar with sexual orientation. And this one, a little easier, it's attraction. Romantic attraction, sexual attraction, spiritual attraction. Um, so this, I've been talking for a little bit, this one, if you want, you can go in the chat. Can I see the chat? You can come off of mute. Give me some examples of a sexual orientation. Do I have a bunch of shy people? Just 
straight, perfect. Gay, straight, lesbian, wonderful. Hetero, very good. Bisexual, bonus points, Rachel, good job. So I feel like we, we nailed the big ones. Um, that's, that's exactly right. I feel like at, at this point in this, in this day and age, fluid. Ooh, I like it, Nancy Parker. Thank you. Asexual. Thank you, Lisa. Great job. Most of us are familiar with sexual orientation. It's, it's that attraction piece. And again, we're not making assumptions that that means that people do or don't want to have sex with someone. We should not be making assumptions on if that sex can make someone pregnant. Um, that's why we ask. We should be asking our patients, not making assumptions. The big thing is, do you have a boyfriend? Do you have a girlfriend? Um, those, those kind of assumptions, again, could very easily negatively impact our relationship and trust with, um, with that patient. If you want to ask about the possibility of pregnancy, do you partner with anyone that could, um, that could result in pregnancy? Are there, is there any chance that you could become pregnant? Um, versus most often, are you sexually active? Um, and then it's pregnancy tests and assumptions. A big thing that I really wanna stress to everyone is just try to steer clear of those assumptions. Let's not make those assumptions because that is then setting you up for failure and impacting that relationship again and not providing the best possible healthcare for that patient if we're making assumptions and putting them in a category of risk or no risk um, and not fully treating that patient um, in a holistic way. So again, sexual orientation is not dictated or driven by assigned sex at birth, gender uh, identity, or gender expression. Um, even, even the terminology, um, if someone identifies as a lesbian, that doesn't mean that they might not be uh, partnering with a transgender woman who still uh, or will continue to have a penis and could pose a risk for pregnancy um, or other health concerns. So again, you know, those, those identities do not dictate each other. And that's a big takeaway I want you to have for this evening um, as well. Okay, if you're a visual learner and not a storyteller listener like me, um, this is the Gender Unicorn. It's a great resource. Please feel free to, to use it. It's free. The website is here, transstudent.org slash gender. This was uh, created specifically by um, transgender folks. And it just helps give a visual of that breakdown. So everything we just talked about up on the top, that gender identity right inside your head. Um, and they show some examples here, female, woman, male, man, or other. That gender expression, again, that outward expression that is heavily influenced by society, cultural, music, movies, feminine, masculine, other, assigned sex at birth, very much related to genitalia that is seen um, at birth, female, male, other, intersex or ambiguous, and then sexual attraction, that physical attraction uh, to men, women, other genders, emotional attraction, to men, women, um, and other genders. So again, just a, just a visual, if, if you're a visual learner, to help kind of put all that together. Pronouns. So I saved, I saved a whole slide for pronouns because I feel like it's one of those, those hot, hot topics, right? Buzzwords, everybody's talking about pronouns. So the big thing I, I wanna share here, as you can see, you know, he, him, she, hers, fill in the blank. And you're like, wait, what is this Z and X? And oh, I think I've seen some they and them in there before. Pronouns are very personal to folks. Sometimes they try one on, they like it, they keep it, they do something else. Some folks use multiple pronouns. You'll see folks that'll have she slash they, or they slash him. There again, is no standard um, set uh, for, for pronouns. The thing I want to stress is, again, that gender identity inside the head and gender expression, uh, the outward dress, does not dictate your pronouns. You could have someone whose gender identity inside the head is male, outward expression is, is feminine, you know, they wear nail polish, they, they perm their hair, who knows, all the things, full face of makeup, and they could use him. 
They could use she, they could use they. Um, the takeaway again is that the gender identity, the gender expression, and very much so the sexual orientation does not dictate someone's pronouns. And if someone shares their pronouns with you, that's the pronoun to use. Also, it is not their preferred pronoun, it's just their pronoun, it's what they, it's what they use. So the example for they, I know some people say they struggle with it. Oh, they is not appropriate for single. APA format has, has backed that singular they is appropriate. And if you've ever written a paper for APA, that's, listen, I don't, I don't mess with APA anymore, uh, but that is, that is the go-to. It is appropriate and we use it all the time. Right now I have attendees on this webinar and I'm sure that they're wonderful. I said they, because I don't know your pronouns. We do it all the time. Um, so it might feel a little clunky, it might feel a little awkward, but if your patient, your coworker, your friend, your family, they tell you, they tell you, um, that their pronouns, their pronouns are they, um, they is what you use. If you make a mistake, when you make a mistake, if you've known someone for a long time and it's a struggle, it is not, the onus is not on them. Don't tell them, oh, it's just so hard. I've known you as this for so long. Or, oh, you just, you don't look like a, a he. Own, own it as soon as you realize it or as soon as they bring it to your attention, apologize. I'll do better and, and move on. Um, that, is a, that is a best practice, um, but then mean it. Do, do better. Um, make sure once you know that you, you apologize and you do better moving forward. Perfect segue into what you can do. You're doing it. You're here. You're educating yourself. You want to know more. You want to do better. And this is an important step. Um, webinars like this with AAACN, um, things online, books, the onus is not on the patient. Let me say that again. You can be curious. You can be honest with your patient and explain that you are not an expert uh, in gender and sexuality studies. Um, but it is not on them to educate you. If they share information with you, if they educate you, that, that is a gift. The onus is not on the patient. Um, educate yourself, educate your peers, educate your coworkers. Examine prejudices or biases that you might have within yourself. And think about it, not in a judgmental way, be curious. Why, why do I think that? Why do I think it's weird if I see someone who I assume is a guy wearing a dress. Why, why do I feel that way when, I, when, when the pronouns don't align? Just be curious about it, ask. Again, same thing with the expression. Our society teaches us a lot of things, whether or not we believe in it, whether or not we support it. Um, TV, music, religion, books, they, they teach us these things. It's not right or wrong. It's just, it's just in our culture. It's just out there. So just really non-judgmentally take time and really examine if you could have any bias, if you could have any prejudice, um, just through, through life, through things you've been taught. Look at your own personal beliefs and your own personal attitude. No one is here today to talk you into being transgender. No one is here today to talk you into a sexual orientation that is not your own. Um, but your patient might be transgender. A large majority uh, will be. We talked about those numbers earlier. Um, if you have personal beliefs and attitudes, um, you need to be aware of them so that you can check them when you go in a room with that patient. Um, because some of those assumptions and some of those stereotypes can be dangerous, can be harmful to a patient um, that, that you're making those assumptions about. Use respectful and inclusive language. Here's a pro tip, patient, is gender neutral. It's a gift. You can just say patient. You don't need to say pregnant moms. You can say pregnant patients. You don't, uh, anytime you can use degendered language, the better, because that's gonna be far more inclusive. Speaking of inclusive language, share your pronouns. When I introduced myself this evening, I shared that I use she, her pronouns. If you can see my name in the presentation, it's there. That's an easy win. That lets anyone in that meeting, that lets anyone that gets your email that you've added it to your signature know that you're respectful of pronoun use and that you are sharing them. With that said, please don't ever force someone to, to share their pronouns. 
they might not be ready to share their pronouns. They might not feel safe to share their pronouns. And for various reasons, they could have been in situations where it was not safe or they were forced to do so, or maybe they're still figuring it out. But you normalizing it, you sharing first sets that stage and allows for that conversation that if they do want to share, that they can. Again, I feel like I've probably said it 20 times by now, but please, please do not make assumptions. Don't make assumptions about gender identity, about gender expression, about sexual orientation, about the pronouns that someone uses. And again, that this is all very fluid. These things change. Your patient might identify this way today. You might see them next year. It might all be very different. Um, so again, please don't make assumptions. We know what happens when you make assumptions. Let's not. And again, once you know more, do better. Once you know someone's pronouns and it's different than maybe you assumed, use those pronouns. So what can your company do to be more inclusive to LGBTQ patients? Create an inclusive environment. Make sure that your signing is not gendered. Um, sexual health, reproductive health, women's health, ob -GYN. Those are Those are very gendered terms, right? Really think about that. Are you providing care for a uterus? Is it re truly reproductive? Is it, are patients with penises being seen in that clinic, getting those services, getting that care? Think, think about your wording. Think about, think about your signage. Um, think about photos. Think about any kind of communications that you have going out. Is it just cisgender, heteronormative looking couples? Are there, BIPOC folks? Are there differently abled folks? Are there LGBT appearing folks? Um, having that diversity lets patients know that you are inclusive, that you are welcoming, that they can go to your offices, to your clinics, and, and be safe, and be welcomed, and be respected. Make sure that your organization and your companies have a non-discrimination policy in place, not just for your staff, but for your patients. When it does have one in place, make sure you post it. Post it in your lobbies. Let, let, your, let your patients know that they are safe receiving care from you. Have inclusive forms and workflows. This one can be a little tricky. This, this can be out of our reach sometimes, but again, part of what we can do is advocate. Inclusive forms, sometimes for um, HRSA measures, reporting, patients in a medical home, the list goes on. There are just terms and words that we have to use related to race, related to gender, related to different identities. When you can be more inclusive, be more inclusive, have more options, options outside of a binary. How could you possibly know how many gender diverse transgender patients you have if male and female is the only option you have on an intake form? You couldn't, there's, there's no way, there's no report that your data team could ever, could ever pull. Ideally, you could have a blank, fill in the blank, gender, fill in the blank, sexual orientation, fill in the blank. A Little harder to report, um, but very, very inclusive. Um, most organizations at this point, most companies are collecting SOGI information, sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and it's, it's important, it's important to know, it's important that we're being inclusive in knowing what patient populations we're serving. Um, same thing for workflows. Um, if it's your workflow for all male patients to do this thing, if it's your workflow that, you know, female patients get this testing and these questions that asked, um, take a look at that, you know, review that. What are you trying to get at? Again, are you looking at risk um, for, for STIs? Are you looking at risk for, for pregnancy? Really, really be curious and, and look at those workflows and see if it's inclusive. Um, or if you could be breaking trust and relationship um, with transgender and gender uh, expressive and expansive patients. Single bathrooms. This one's hard, I get it. Um, if your bathroom's already set up, they're already set up. But ideally for both staff and patients, single bathrooms can be a lifesaver, literally, because they don't have to make that decision of what gender do I look like to everybody else here to make sure that I feel safe enough to go into that bathroom and use it. Um, I have accompanied many friends and partners into bathrooms. 
so that they're not attacked or even just looked at funny or screamed at um, for thinking that someone's in, in the wrong bathroom. This is hard because a lot of times we're in buildings that we don't that we don't have control over. But if you can advocate for single bathrooms, if you can advocate for um, better signage for bathrooms, um, that's a huge that's a huge win for for patients and for staff. Company-wide trainings. Um, this is the perfect month. June, June is the month to talk your company into doing a training for everyone. Um, and it can be as high level um, as possible about respect. We respect all our patients. We wanna be as inclusive for our patients as possible. And um, I have some resources coming up on, on different trainings that you can offer for, for your staff. Uh, lastly, your company can offer affinity groups for employees, advisory boards, listening sessions for LGBTQ patients, especially if you're looking at expanding your services. If you're looking at offering um, gender affirming health services, if you're looking at offering hormones, um, don't make assumptions for the patients. Definitely invite them in, invite them into your spaces, um, hear about their experiences, um, listen to their words, listen to their feedback. It's very, it's very, very valuable. Um, that is what your company could easily do and make a win and be like, oh, did you did you see that LGBT meeting coming up for the patients of Dr. Smith's office? That's so great. I didn't even know that they cared about, about me, about my uh, population, about you know, my community. That's a that's a huge trust builder. This is a huge resource. If you're not familiar, um, take take a note. HRC or the Human Rights Campaign every year for the last 15 years has done the Healthcare Equality Index. Um, the website's here at the bottom and I have it again um, at the end of this study. Uh, they are very proud to be celebrating their 15 year. This is huge important work um, that is being done. And right now, this last um, index that they did, they had over 2000 healthcare facilities nationwide. Um, it's a great resource because it includes uh, evaluation of healthcare facilities policies and practices related to equality and in inclusion for LGBT patients, um, visitors and employees. Uh, some very big name um, healthcare organizations are involved in this and it's uh, and they have tons of great resources. If you're like, I have no idea how to write a non-discrimination policy. I have, I have no idea how to make my workflows more inclusive. Um, HRC offers some really great resources here and it's all free. Next up, plug, uh, again, I work for Fenway Health, but part of Fenway Health is the Fenway Institute and the National LGBTQ um, Health Education Center. You can go to this website, um, create an account, and there are tons of videos and webinars and publications and learning modules that you can, you know, become train the trainer and bring this to your company, bring this to your team, bring this to your nurses. And it's all broke up. You can see there on the right by different filters. Maybe you're a specialist in BH. Um, maybe you're at an oncology office. Maybe you do PEDS. Maybe you're a sexual health clinic. There's tons of different resources. And the best thing is a lot of these, almost all of these have CEs attached. Um, so you can offer these to your staff and it's free CEs. So please uh, definitely check it out. It's a really great um, resource. And like I mentioned, most of them are eligible um, for CEs or CMEs uh, for your RNs. So I've been talking for a while. I wanna make sure that there's time uh, for questions. And again, no silly question. Um, this is a learning space. No one expected you to come here and be an expert. I'd much rather you learn here and ask and us talk together uh, than, um, than bumble in front of a patient. So uh, I'll go ahead and open up the floor. Um, you can come off a of mute if you're comfortable. Um, I can pull up the chat and see if there's some, some questions there. But um, before we, we transition, just thank you again for taking the time. Like I said, I know it's a weekday. You probably had a long day in your office. I'm very, very thankful that you took the time to join this webinar, to learn more, to do better, and hopefully bring it back uh, to your coworkers and your organization. So thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and, and look in the chat, see if there's any questions there. Okay, so I have a great question here from Deborah. Deborah asks, is it appropriate to ask someone what their pronouns, uh, what their pronoun is? Um, 
you, you can. It's better to ask than to assume and be wrong. Um, but again, you should not force it. If you ask and they don't feel comfortable disclosing, um, if it's part of the uh, conversation. So, hi, my name's Nikki. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, and they say, hey, my name's Chris. Chris, uh, do you mind sharing your pronouns? And they say, no. All right, Chris, it is. You can always use someone's name. Uh, don't be like, well, I need to know your pronouns. I have to know how to talk to you or how to refer to you. No, it's Chris. It's okay. Uh, what is the website again here? Let me, oh, ah, there we go. A um, couple good resources here. Up at the top is the GLMA, which their name is not terribly inclusive, but they do have really great resources. And that's glma.org, um, the HRC, the Healthcare Equity Index. You can Google <laughs> HRC Healthcare Equity Index, um, or the, the website is here. And um, the training website is the Fenway Health Institute. Again, you can also Google Fenway Health Institute, but it's fenwayhealth.org backslash the Fenway Institute. Oh, Ed, thank you, Kim, coming in with the assist. Thank you, Kim, for the uh, website for the um, visual representation of gender and sexual sexuality. Uh, Lisa shared, what we struggled with is that the SOGI categories are different for different entities requiring the reporting. Yes, similar to race, so similar to ethnicity, this is a huge issue. Sadly, there's not a standardization um, across the board because, right, you're reporting to HRSA and NCQA, and sometimes those identities uh, vary. It's it's tough and there's limitations there. Some folks also have limitations within their EHR, um, not being able to offer as many options as they'd like. Sadly, um, these are just limitations we have, but I'm, I'm glad that you're, you're aware of that. Oh, thank you, Terry. Kind compliment there. Thank you, Levita. Go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And if you need those websites again, we can certainly, I can certainly share those. Um, so just, the, the time is yours. No silly question, no wrong question. Anything about gender, sexuality? So Nikki, can you hear me? I can. Hi, thank you so much for, for doing this. It's been really a lot of good information and I'm really glad to be here and to have you available. Uh, and willing to to teach us, right, and to share your your knowledge. I'm curious at at your place of work at Fenway Health. Uh, how how did you go about um, training people? You know, we get we have employees, staff that are all over the spectrum as far as their beliefs, their you know their um, biases. How how do you start? Um, in terms of planning training and um, and and how how do you measure that it made a difference in mm -hmm. in how somebody treats a patient like before and after? Um, Great questions. Um, very big, important questions, Deborah. Thank you. Um, a few things. One, things like this, things that are not just pressing the button. You know, the documentation, the taking the blood pressure. I always always got to bring it back to the patient always got to bring it back to the patient. I guarantee everyone here has LGBT patients. All of our patients deserve respect and the best possible healthcare period. If, you're, if your staff don't, don't support that, that's a, different, that's a different conversation. Now, again, no, is, no one is asking that staff to have a different religious belief. No one is asking that staff to have a, a different practice within their own life. Um, what we are asking is that you respect patients that do. And if they can't, that's a, that's a different conversation, right? But ultimately, these are the identities that our patients have. And to safely and best treat them, these are best practices. These are shown. You can easily find papers, reports, literature, reviews, studies that show that patient-centered care best practices start with inclusive environments and respectful healthcare. So that's where I start. That, that super high level is that we respect all of our patients and maybe you don't jump right in, right? Maybe, maybe you're in a very conservative place. You know, I'm, I'm in a big city. I'm in Boston, Massachusetts. Maybe you're in a, a small, rural, Southern conservative town. That's okay. Maybe you don't start with sexual orientation and gender. Maybe you start with race. Maybe you start with ageism, 
maybe you, you know, start a series of how can we better serve underserved patients, right? Ageism, there's, there's lots of entry points, right? Because that intersectionality lives within all of us. We all have those identities, right? We don't just show up one way. We're not just a woman, straight, religion, you know, like we, we have all those things that impacts all of it. So you could really have this be a bigger piece of we honor and respect all of our patients and their identities and that they show up in all these amazing and in, in different ways. Um, and that's and that's where you create the buy-in, right? Because that's that's where that comes from. Getting as as often as I can, I try to create that buy-in with staff. Now we know sometimes it just is it is what it is, and, and we can't create that buy-in and we don't have time. But this this has to be done in a very thoughtful way, an inclusive way to our staff. Otherwise, it's another thing. It's a training that I got to go to and sign the box and keep it moving. Now, again, we won't change, we won't change hearts and minds for everybody, but providing respectful care to our patients is a minimum. I, I can't imagine anyone's mission, anyone's strategic plan, anyone's, you know, statement doesn't include respectful patient care. And that's exactly what you bring it back to every single time. Um, for the um, for the data, that one's a little harder. I'm a big fan of the pre-quiz and the after-quiz. Um, a lot of times I find that my staff will word things way better than I ever thought how to word it. Um, so, you know, maybe beforehand you can ask, you know, what does LGBT mean? You know, what does it mean to you? Um, how are ways in which uh, we are serving or underserving LGBT patients. Um, it's hard because it's not a metric that's as easy to quantify, but I feel like if you focus on the, the qualitative data, you, you might get some better, some better things there. And again, going into those meetings, going into those trainings with folks, th think about your outcome, right? Like, what is, you know, what is your outcome? What is the ideal state coming out of that meeting for that staff? Is it to understand that our words matter? Is it to understand that we should not be making assumptions about our patients as they you know, walk through our doors? Um, and really, and really kind of try to teach to that and see how the data does. A big thing, a big indicator for things like this is your press gaining. Um, your patient satisfaction is huge for this. Um, if LGBT patients feel you know, that their healthcare providers are fearful, not understanding of them, um, you know, not, not respectful of them, that, pre, that press gainy score is, is going to show it. Um, and that, you know, that's not, that's not the end all be all, but it's impactful. Um, it's impactful and, and it's meaningful. Um, you know, that patient experience is so important. That relationship is so important. And if we're not being inclusive to the whole patient, it's just, we're, we're truly doing the patient a disservice and we're setting ourselves up for failure. So I feel like I didn't give you a perfect answer there, but hopefully that was some information that was helpful. Yes, very helpful. Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, of course. Just heading back to the chat. Oh, thank you. Of course. Thank you. Great. And Lisa shared, sometimes you have to have uncomfortable conversations to let people know that some words and phrases are not okay and be open when someone needs to have um, that conversation with you. That's, and that's exactly right. There's always things that we can do better to be better humans, to be better nurses, um, to be better. Um, I think often uh, people don't realize the impact that their words have. And if these words are hurtful and someone tells you that, if someone gifted with that feedback, they have to do better. And it, it, it surrounds us. And again, it doesn't mean you're a bad, it doesn't mean you're a bad nurse. Um, that just means you were taught to use that word for this thing, or you heard people use that word to describe this thing. I have been very intentional with my language to make sure that um, I'm not ableist in my language. So much of our, our terminology and our phrase phrases are incredibly ableist, um, saying that you stand for something when you really mean that you support it. Um, even, you know, group roles, a lot of times people say, uh, step up, step back. Um, you know, we've switched within Fenway Health to say, take space and make space. Um, even the term lame, um, which uh, is probably used in a benign way, has ableist roots and can be upsetting. And the same thing goes 
for race, same thing goes for LGBT patients. And that's not to say, again, that you're a bad person if you use those words, but know that using those words could hurt someone, could hurt your coworker, could hurt a patient. And that's the last thing that we wanna do. We wanna welcome our patients and we want our, our coworkers to feel safe and supported. So thank you um, so much for that, um, Lisa. Um, Nancy says, how do you refer to young children who change pronouns regularly? I've been using gender fluid, but that sounds like it is about sexual orientation, which wouldn't be accurate. Uh, great, uh, great question, Ann, Nancy. This, one, this one's hard. Um, a lot of healthcare providers are reporting that a lot of folks in pediatrics are very fluid. They, they don't believe in labels at all. They, they jump around. Like I had mentioned, it's they this month, it's she next month, it's, it's him, it's all over the place. And again, it's like a hat, they're trying it on, they're seeing if it fits. Um, gender fluid is an acceptable term. Gender um, expansive is also an acceptable term, but the best thing that you can do, um, Nancy, is you can always ask that patient. Um, you can ask them uh, what, the best, um, what the best term is, um, how, how do they want to be referred to? I think it's definitely um, personalized. It's very, it's very individual. Um, and like I said, it can jump around a lot. So it's important for us not to feel frustrated. Um, it's certainly not personal. They're not changing their pronouns and identity just to mess with us in our, or in, in our uh, documentation. Um, but striving to do better, asking questions like that, wanting to be accurate and uh, respectful um, is, is very important. So uh, gender fluid, gender expansive is a completely appropriate and respectful way to identify someone that does not necessarily identify as heterosexual or straight. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Uh, Kim put in there, everyone can keep learning. I've been on this DEI learning journey for a while now, and I learned some very valuable info tonight. Oh, uh, thanks, Kim. Great job. Um, Susan. I came late to the meeting and maybe this was covered, but Lisa's comment made me think about this. When I was young, we were taught saying someone was queer was wrong. Um, now people use it, so it can be confusing. Susan, thank you so much for bringing this up. That's a great point. Again, it's very nuanced and very personal to folks. Some folks uh, have embraced and reclaimed the term queer. Some people find it incredibly offensive. Um, some patients still identify as transsexual or use some more out there, outdated terms. Um, some folks find it offensive. Again, asking the patient, mirroring the language that they use is, is a huge pro tip for you. If they say that they identify as X, Y, and Z, if they use their own um, pronouns, you know, take your lead from them, listen to them. Don't, please don't ever, like Nikki was in that meeting and she told me that you're gender fluid. <laughs> um, trust, trust your patient. That, I think that really gets to the heart of it. And that's a conversation I have with my nurses a lot is trusting our patients as the subject matter experts of their own lives. They live that life every day. If they tell you something is, is you know, called this, Call, call it that, respect that, um, use, use their words um, until they don't or they ask you to, to do differently. Um, but it is completely appropriate to, to ask them. If you ask someone's sexual orientation and they tell you I'm queer, um, that's, that's acceptable in the term that they're using. Um, fluid, language is fluid, language is always changing. Um, you know, terms that are okay today weren't okay yesterday um, and vice versa. So I would say take, take the lead from the patient. And again, be humble, um, you know, be, be honest with the patient, tell the patient, I'm, I'm not an expert here, but I wanna learn more and do better. Thank you so much for sharing that with me. I'll make a note of that, I'll document that. Yeah. Amy says, I find that this is the same for all patients, even outside of LGBTQ. Cultural humidity is so important. Don't be afraid to ask. Exactly right. Um, that's, a, that's a great point, Amy. Again, as I mentioned, I remember in nursing school, they just, you know, they taught you that cultural competency and that you treat all this category of patient the same. You know, you do this thing for all the, these patients. Um, and how, how assumptive, how disrespectful. Um, I feel like I must have studied so many uh, board questions about, you know, what do you do for this kind of patient? What consideration do you need to do for this kind of patient? Um, and that's, that's so assumptive. That's, that's assuming that that religion, that race, that sexual orientation, all do the same 
thing the exact same way. Um, and that's just not true. We know humans don't work like that. So um, great points, great questions. Um, and we're just at about time. So I'll look to, to my bosses uh, over here, Pete, Pete and Amy to see uh, our next steps. But if you think of any questions, um, if you think of anything after the fact, that's usually what I do. I'll be pondering something tomorrow. Um, you know, please don't hesitate to, to reach out. I can um, share my email here with you if you have questions. My email is n a l c a l a at fenwayhealth.org, and I'll go ahead and pop that in the chat too. And if this All is right. you're interested in learning more about, that Fenway uh, website is a great, great resource for you. Thanks, Nikki. And thank you for everyone uh, for joining us tonight. Um, again, this presentation was recorded, so we'll be sharing it with the rest of our uh, AAACN members who may not have been able to join us tonight for any reason. Really wonderful information. Thank you so much for joining us on short notice, Nikki, um, and everyone else. Really, uh, I think it was fabulous. Great way to end Pride Month. 